It's CyberConnect's 25th anniversary! Well, it was earlier this year. I kind of missed it by a few months for unavoidable reasons. Yes, CyberConnect, a Bandai subsidiary developer founded in February of 1996 that has a near and dear place in my heart. A game company most known for the .hack franchise, the greatest successful cross-media franchise on the planet as long as you ignore the franchise's third season, content that's terrible, and a collection of well-liked anime adaptation games. Primarily ones for Naruto that I have never nor will ever play. And also having a solid reputation of helping in the development of other games all the time. Like the Final Fantasy VII Remake, which they got slandered over for years when they left the project as being the cause for its delays because Tetsuya Nomura doesn't like them. And that was the big lie gaming journalism perpetuated. They actually were responsible for a large volume of the Seven Remake. There's an entire misinformation mess all revolving around that, but basically a statement by Nomura was misconstrued into an attack on CyberConnect, when the reality was the part of the game he was working on had to be done over from scratch not the parts CyberConnect had completed for them. But gaming journalism for some reason always seems to bend over backwards for Square Enix and Nomura despite their history of screw-ups for the last 15 years. As yeah, games from CyberConnect literally saved me from my own bad end. Of course I was not going to respond well to disingenuous accusations when from all accounts business-wise CyberConnect leaving the project was an amicable split. Honestly, despite my tentative completion of .hack retrospective, this misconduct on the game journalism side of things only made me want to play and revisit more content CyberConnect 2 is inevitably responsible for in an effort to prove them wrong, and reveal CC2's own brand of innovations and insights that can be gleaned about the game industry from those who have lived and thrived as a small-time development studio with just above 200 people to their name. Hell, as company head Hiroshi Matsuyama himself has said in his regular YouTube Q&As, they're doing their best to branch out and become international as that's where the majority of gamers are and understand the value of localization and distribution, which a lot of other companies to this day still do not understand. And a lot of their new IPs such as Fuga Melodies of Steel, Tokyo Overgate, and Sestil, which right now are in varying stages of production, are meant as simpler, fun to replay projects that avoid the microtransaction mess mainstreaming gaming has become and reinvent and modernize the stronger basic foundations of gaming, while likewise allowing the newer staff on their development teams the experience they need to do great on their bigger commissioned works, like the Kimetsu no Yaiba game that's in development by them now. I have read Hiroshi Matsuyama's book as well, and the insight it offers not only into the Japanese game industry, the core precepts of CyberConnect that have made them a solid developer, such as setting a hard limit of making sure any game's development is capable of taking place to completion over a solid three years, when other companies have struggled and collapsed by taking either forever or releasing an unfinished product, and the frustrations in making sure their projects and releases, while not always perfect, are inevitably endearing to their player base and audience, even if those who they develop the games for inevitably screw over some element of them as happened both with Capcom in regards to the paid DLC main story content nonsense they pulled with Ashura's Wrath, or some of the structural problems of the more recent Dragon Ball Z Kakarot that more had to do with Bandai's requirements and the story they were developing, as opposed to their original core mechanics. CyberConnect has made their own blunders, assuredly, the entire third season of Link Onwards for Dot .hack being amongst that, and we're certain to see a few of their lesser liked and developed elements in this, as from here, I'm going to be exploring the game CyberConnect has developed outside of .hack or had references to their company put into them. So it's not just going to be games they are credited with or helped in developing, but also things like Tales of Grace's Eth, which has character costumes, the Project Cross Zone games where the characters and elements of their settings appear as part of the story, and even Hyper Dimension Neptunia where a character representation of the company itself has a role in their rebirth titles. I'm going to try and touch on all of these that I can in time, if I can in time, not just to show off what they did, but how they are seen in a positive light in their industry, and how they share that positivity with others. And I am beginning all of this, of course, with their beginning, the Little Tail Bronx game series. Little Tail Bronx is CyberConnect's name for a collection of games that use anthropomorphic animal characters as the main protagonists usually with said creatures piloting riding robots to do tasks and fight enemies. To date, the series consists of today's topic of discussion, Tail Concerto for the PlayStation 1, but also Solata Robo, Red Hunter for the Nintendo DS, 
the mobile game Little Tale Story, and the upcoming Fuga Melodies of Steel. There is no set continuity between said games as far as I'm aware, merely recurrence of a setting motif with the animal beings all ending up in just a petty feud between species. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria! Directly about this once again from the mouths of the series developers is, they're meant to be some big, hard, complex, get good, scrub nonsense that is endlessly a source of challenge and frustration or repetitious experience you get bored with, but instead be a memorable journey you can just have fun with experiencing. Endear yourselves with the cast of characters and having so much fun with the game mechanics which itself will drive interest in your playing the games. That right there explains more than anything why Cyberconnect has been so enduring and well-liked in the community despite being a small developer. They really understand that the products they make are not disposable commodities that can be rushed out without care every year for more money, but something that should be seen as having value in and of itself to re-experience. And that has been something I've experienced with their games again and again. Tale Concerto is the first in that series, and first game Cybertech published back in 1998. While it was developed for Bandai, because Bandai didn't have their foot quite in the door yet in the American gaming market like they would only a year later as they started exporting more and more anime tie-in content, the game was instead imported by Atlas, the game studio most known for the Shin Megami Tensei and Persona franchise, who had actually already made it big with the M17 and Persona games that were on the PS1. In Tale Concerto, you play as Police Officer Waffle, a McGruff the Crime Dog type that normally heads up a small town precinct, but is called in alongside his criminal crapture robo on his day off. Woo! Overtime! What? I worked over 400 hours of overtime last year on top of working on my web series. I'm kind of a workaholic by this point. The Black Cat Pirates, headed by the Pris sister trio of Elisa, Stare, and Flair, are going around causing trouble with their minions all around a floating collection of steampunkish archipelagos in the Kingdom of Prairie. Yes, seriously, there are a lot of name puns like that in this game. In search of a collection of magic crystals on behalf of the game's actual villain, Fool. Elysia is the main focus of Waffle's attention in all of this, as the two are actually childhood friends, and unbeknownst to both of them, a crystal Waffle found and gifted Elysia with is one of those Fool is seeking to claim. At some point in their backstory, however, Waffle and Alicia had a falling out, Alicia and her foster sisters disappearing and falling on hard times, the orphanage they all lived in even being abolished, Alicia coming to hate the dog people of the country because in the past they purportedly stole the rule of it from the cat people with how her kind tend to end up oppressed in the society and at the hands of its rulers, including the like of the otherwise kind Princess Teria. Yes, seriously who she shares a romantic rivalry with, as even though she acts like a sundere, helped in the English dub of the game having Alicia voiced by Amanda Wynn Lee of Dot .hack Evangelion and Persona fame, who knows how to pull off a good sundere voice, and actually is mad at Waffle for getting in her way, as she still likes the big lug despite protests to the contrary. Waffle, you won't get away with this! You just wait. Next time, Gadget! NEXT TIME! Alicia, you shouldn't be spying on them. I'm watching the enemy! Hey, don't get so close to him, you tramp! What's the big idea, stalking Waffle? That thing where you pretend to hate someone, but really you're nuts about them? What do they call it again? It's plain hard to get. That's it. And that, in turn, ends up a situation amusingly, but also unfortunately paralleled later in the iMock.hack games. The love triangle between Kite, Black Rose, and Terajima Ryoko was intentionally recreated from the love feud first presented here with Waffle, Alicia, and Terraria. Though, what I love about this game in retrospect is actually how much it fits with later content. Not just the other little Tail Bronx games, as infrequently as they are made, but, well... All of CyberConnect's original works, now that I'm looking at them like this, seems to have a recurrence of themes in both story and design sense that I hadn't had a good sight into before, as it only really played the Dot .hack games and their anime tie-in games before this. If you look into the Dot .hack archive books, you see a lot of Tail Concerto-inspired art in them, despite them not being done by Tail Concerto's artists. Not just to what you think of the name illusions in the IMOC games with both of the principal Tail Concerto characters being renamed in that as NPCs, 
or the Ya, Lei, and Two Tribe character models from Dadak GU invoking the feel of the Little Tail Bronx characters themselves. On top of both of these, so many of the cast have a little anthropomorphic version of the characters depicted in the archive books, and it's all kinds of adorable. And not just that, but the Tail Concerto setting honestly feels like something that would fit in an in-universe story for the World R2 in GU's era of Dot Hack, with the cast being all lay tribe members in an offshoot village or small isolated kingdom. The whole Steam Tech feeling, buried ancient evils and gods, the World R2 incarnation is super consistent with Cyberpunk 2's prior work before the original Dot Hack games, and it makes me wonder if that's part of why it's considered the company's best work even by those within the corporation, as it honors both sides of their starting ground with both the silly adventure in Tale Concerto and the serious character story and scenario they presented in Silent Bomber and the IMOC games. Ironically, at least on the art and design side of this, the artist for this game was Nobuteri Yuki, known more for Record of Lodos War, Escaflone, and Chrono Cross, as opposed to one of the regular artists that would later collaborate with them. For as far as I can find, Yuki hasn't again. And yet, I can't help but see the contiguity with the later content. Anyways, Alicia's hate is what's motivating her to collect these crystals. Fool telling her that this is all for the reassertion of the cat-ruled nation, with Waffle assigned the unenviable task of bringing in his old friend, and the capture of her various minions and the sisters. This is where we get to the gameplay, and there is a bit of a learning curve to learning how to pilot Waffle's giant robot and its systems if you're only used to how modern games map out their controls, as opposed to ones from the PS1 era. Obviously, you orient the mech with the D-pad, fire capture bubbles that damage robots and seal up the cat pirates you're tasked with stopping, but sometimes it's a bit hard to hit the angle they're at properly, in part due to this being a PS1 game, and find controls being a rarity in that era for overworld platformers like this especially, as to actually move forward and back, you gotta hold the R1 and R2 controls to trigger that, as opposed to there being a more free range of movement just being D-pad tied. You can reorient your arc of fire with L1 and L2, but it's not easy to aim either. Part of why these controls are so janky but still functional is, well, how many of you only know of the DualShock styled PlayStation controllers? Yeah, those were not the original controllers for the PlayStation 1, and were not implemented and distributed until late 1997 in Japan and mid-98 in the West. The original PlayStation did not have the analog stick to help with controls, just a D-pad. Companies developing games at the time did not know of it in advance to be able to take advantage of the additional analog sticks for improving their control schemes in regards to fine movements or aiming. At best, they adjusted the programming of their games to read the left analog stick as an alternative to the D-pad. And without those analog sticks, you couldn't do anything related to fine controls, such as the now commonly practice of using a right analog stick for aiming at things in a 3D environment as that didn't exist yet. Thus, if you had to aim, it was usually tied to something that reoriented your sight up and down. And it sucked consistently across all video games that utilized such a mechanic, but we had nothing better until the PlayStation 2 and GameCube era. Eventually, though, Waffle's Police Robo will also gain the ability to fly in the air Leaf Area, which is just a population of small floating islands. You fly there by using X to jump, then the D-pad to steer, it's actually not that badly implemented for the time, the biggest issue being you need to conserve your fuel between jumps. So yeah, your goal for the game is to track Alicia as she and her gang rampage around Prairie looking for the crystals as they're supplied all their resources by Fool, occasionally it culminating in a boss fight as one or another pilots a cat-themed giant robot themselves to try and smash Waffle's pursuit, though they always end up pulling their punches. Really, the only truly challenging encounters with these kitty katakuris are on your fight on a cliff where it's very easy to get turned around and actually walk off the cliff as you're dodging attacks, and then a pair at the end of the game that are wielding the Goldion Hammer from King of Braves Gal Gygar that sends out shockwaves that are a bit difficult to dodge. Oh, sure, it's the standard practice of jump over them to avoid the shockwaves you see from games in this era, but unlike other games that do it, the shockwaves released are markedly closer together at their source and thus more difficult to dodge. This making a matter of fighting them a slip between trying to get close to aim for the weak point, before running away as the shockwaves start to be able to properly evade them. Really, the fights beyond this aren't that hard, 
it just ends up being environmental stuff that can screw you over. Either not being distinct enough tells, or the general problem of platforming within PS1 games that don't have the best controls to be able to make fine, accurate turns and movements. I think the worst it gets are two stages. The first is two-thirds of the way through the game, where you invade one of the facilities Fool gave the Black Cat Pirates to use, that is, the production facility for all Fool's weapons. You have to travel through and smash the place up, with eventually the self-destruct being triggered. But the only way out is to bum-rush your way through several rooms that you need to climb up and around through. And it's pretty easy to not only miss the jump as there's a bunch of moving platforms, but the second room of it can have you not only fall off the retracting platforms, but get stabbed by spikes. Hell, there's not even a real platform at parts. You'll end up just needing to jump it blind. And last is, as you'd expect, the end game. See, Fool's big goal is to use the five crystals to revive the legendary weapon of Prairie, the Iron Giant. Superman? There are about a dozen people in my audience that would get that reference. The Iron Giant's an ancient artifact that Waffle's retired dad, Russell, yes, seriously, has been researching and telling us legends of all throughout the game. How it was constructed to protect people, but its designers did kind of a bad job, thus had to seal it away lest it destroy everything. And the problem, of course, of giant super weapons from ancient times... You might be able to figure out how to activate them, but not so much how to control them. Thus, once Fool starts it up, it straight starts rampaging, killing the big bad in the process, and Alicia getting trapped within it as she tried to recover her own crystal as it was absorbed into the thing, leading to Waffle entering the giant as well to save her and shut it down. This is, of course, the most frustrating level of the game, not because it's hard, not because the enemies are a pain, but because of the platforming. Jumping on and moving through a bunch of platforms to reach the control room of the Iron Giant, only for your expected movements that you've learned throughout the game to compensate for, to be screwed over and slowed down by the game trying to mimic you being in an aquatic environment. Again, to echo the parallels to CyberConnect's later works, this feels like you're inside one of the organic dungeons of the World R1, and fighting the Kubia Gomorrahs and needing the fights with the antithesis of Twilight in either the IMOC or GU games. But travel is just so slow through this, and as your movement timing is off thanks to the slowdown of simulating moving through water, you are going to fall a lot. I'll give it this though, I didn't die from doing this. This is not the kind of region where you get screwed over like that. You just drop to the bottom and have to start again. It still gets frustrating, but it's nowhere as bad as it could be if, say, a full damage mechanic had been added in here where a drop to our deaths was a guaranteed death sentence. As Hiroshi Matsuyama only knows why, but this is one of those games that has a spare lives mechanic where you need to collect spares in the event you die in a boss battle because that was still a common thing in those days to have won in most games. Thank you so much to the PS2 era, and its general discontinuation and growth beyond such outside the rare outlier like, say, the Sonic franchise or some Super Mario content where it's expected to have such. But yeah, if you're not able to adapt to this fast, it'll take a while before you get used to the action delay to be able to handle climbing up, and then you need to deal with the command core for the robot that'll shut it down. This battle is insanely hard, for similar reasons to the hammer robots earlier, in that it's hard to avoid its attacks and relatedly damage it enough to send it packing. And worse, this is a multi-stage boss battle, as after you defeat it once, it will then become infused with the power of the crystals powering the Iron Giant, which... What? Yeah, CyberConnect in the first game outing pulled a fast one and made you think it was going to be a multiple stage boss fight, but no. Which makes sense. The Iron Giant only has power by bringing the five crystals together. Of course it'd shut down if one was broken. With this, the day is saved. The Iron Giant is permanently retired, and while Waffle and Alicia appear to reconcile, there's nothing keeping the cat from living their nine lives of mischief. 
Tale Concerto, all things considered, including the idiosyncrasies of game development on the PlayStation 1, is not bad at all. By modern standards, it's still a bit lacking, but even 23 years since its release, it's still pretty decent and fun to play, and a good first outing from a freshman game development company. And that likewise reflects on how it was received the time and since, actually pretty positively. Even people going back to reflect on it in modern times see it as a pretty positive experience even with age which is exactly the niche CyberConnect games like to hit. Though sadly because it was the first game from a company, there wasn't the best advertising nor marketing for it, a recurring problem with CyberConnect games in my experience, it only having gotten attention through word of mouth, but ultimately with it not receiving good enough sales back in the day to warrant a sequel. Hiroshi Matsuyama and the game's head developers did try immediately after to pitch a Tale Concerto 2 with the complete story ready to go, but Bandai did not bite. The sales not making them consider it worth the time, with the company giving up on it for the time being and focusing their attention instead on the dot .hack. This also explains a bit of why the iMock NPCs are named after Tail Concerto characters, and why the Cat series equipment exists in the game to summon a cat robot as well, keeping alive their first game with their next big project, even with them trying to pitch the project again after dot .hack's success. To no real luck at getting through on the matter. Obviously, though, this was not the end of the world of Tale Concerto. In 2005, Nobuteru Yuki would again partner with CyberConnect in order to create a public safety mascot for the Fukuoka Prefecture of Japan, Fukuoka being where CyberConnect 2's first and home office is located, and they used art and story assets from the plans for Tale Concerto 2 in that project. The mascot, named Mamoru-kun, was used in promotion of Fukuoka's disaster warning email program, and since it's become a fixture of the region's PSAs and preparedness messaging. And in the stories created for the character, it was revealed that he comes from the world of Little Tail Bronx, where the name first appeared in relation to this little franchise. With CyberConnect later finally getting together the resources on their own to later produce the spiritual successor, Sulata Robo, 12 years later. Which ultimately goes to show that you can never keep a decent idea down. It just depends on how much of a cult success you had on whether it's returned to with any expedience. So, yeah, a good first outing from CyberConnect only held back by the elements of the era it was produced in. If you've got the capability to play PS1 games, I'd say check it out, if only to see where the company started out from. But of course, this was not the only game CyberConnect did before it dived deep into development of the greatest multimedia spanning cohesive work of fiction. Oh no. They did one other game for the PlayStation 1, one more known for its own challenges to its players. I will see you all next time for Silent Bomber. Uh -huh.